Shalom to everybody. Thank you for joining us tonight. We just did a Bible study in Italian about this uh, subject, and now we are doing it in English for your viewing pleasure. And we thank you for joining us tonight because we hope that um, this will um, help a lot of people who may still be asking uh, about Jesus or Yeshua and whether he is truly the Messiah, because there are many people out there who truly are actually asking these questions and who are seeking uh, for answers in these interesting times. So thank you for joining us today. Uh, we hope that you enjoy our Bible study. And I will ask, uh, we'd like to open up in prayer now. Mm -hmm. So here we are, we are live from Beit Shalom here in Pozzuoli, Italy. And um, as many of you, we are on a lockdown, so we cannot go anywhere unless it's for absolute necessity. And uh, so this is what we are we are doing. We want to go live and just share the word of God, no matter what happens. Mm -hmm. Nothing's going to stop us. All right. So thank you for joining us. Amen. Father, we come before your throne to ask you for forgiveness for all of our sins, for all of our actions, thoughts, and um, any word that came out from our mouth that is not aligned to your will, to your desire for our lives. Father, we ask you for protection from your Holy Spirit, from your Ruach HaKodesh in all of our lives. Wherever we go, wherever we stay, Father, protect our houses as you did to your people, Israel, during the time in Egypt. You covered all of their houses with your hand, with your mighty hand. While everything was passing by, the people of Israel were just covered by your hand, by your powerful and mighty hand. And they will they were just protected and they didn't have any any issue, any problems, any any sickness, but also they were protected in every way. They were guided, they were led to your Torah, to receive your Torah upon the Mount Sinai. And that's what we ask you, Lord, to receive your holiness, your guidance, your Torah tonight, to receive your Holy Spirit, your Ruach HaKodesh in us, through us, to the people of Israel first and to the Gentiles in the nations. And Father, we pray for all people of Israel, in Israel and in diaspora, that they might receive you, Yeshua HaMashiach, as their Savior in their heart, that their heart of stone will be transformed in the heart of the flesh, and they will see who you are. They will receive your revelation, Yeshua, of who you are in their lives. In Yeshua's mighty name, Amen. And Father, we ask you also for unity in the Ruach HaKodesh above all denominations, all over the nations, Father, we know that you are working in us and through us to pray. And there are many believers in Yeshua which are praying at the same time now in USA and other nations, Father, in India, in Africa, whatever they are, Father. Now we ask you in unity that your Ruach HaKodesh shall unite us in you, Yeshua, under your name, the only name, the name of you, our Messiah, Yeshua HaMashiach. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Rebbe King Gabriela. And uh, now we just want to, um, we want to share with you a very fun and wonderful um, Bible study that we have been, like I said earlier, doing in Italian. And so what we're doing tonight is talking about Yeshua or Jesus. And how does he pass the test of messiahship? All right, sir. For those of you out there who are saying, well, Jesus is not the Messiah, there are people out there who are still denying that Yeshua or Jesus was the Messiah. Of course, many people are uh, Jews, okay? But there are other people out there basically doing the same thing, all right, denying his messiahship. So shalom to all of you. And as I said, uh, my name is uh, Rabbi uh, Harel Clint Fry from Pozzuoli, Italy, here at Beit Shalom uh, Congregation. And uh, I just wanted to talk to you about this and how can we prove Yeshua or Jesus' Messiahship. 
So rabbis have taught us throughout the millennia that Messiah would come as the son of David. God personally made that promise to David in the scriptures, such as in 1 Chronicles chapter 17, verse 11. And it says, and it shall come to pass when your days be expired, that you must go to be with your fathers, and that I will raise up your seed after you, which shall be of your sons, and I will establish his kingdom. And so does Yeshua or Jesus pass the first test of Messiahship? And what is that? So if a person either claimed to be the Messiah or others proclaimed him to be Messiah, the first test he had to pass is the question of lineage. Is he a direct descendant of King David? All right. So if such ancestry, ancestry could not be verified, the claim would end. So let's find out if Yeshua or Jesus passes the critical messianic test by following the seed's journey through scripture starting at creation. So let's talk about the ban being banished with Adam and Eve. Now Jewish and liter Christian literature since the time of Yeshua have pointed to Genesis chapter 3 verse, fi verse 15 as the first reference to the Messiah in the Torah. Okay. Now here, because of the serpent's seduction, which brought separation between man and God, we see that God had already set in motion his grand plan for sending the Messiah, a seed, to redeem us back to himself. This is what he tells this crafty serpent. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring or seed, or in Hebrew, zera, and her offspring. Zera, he will pound your head and you will bite his heel. Now, banished from the garden with Adam and Eve, <clears throat> we follow Cain and his descendants to determine if he carries this promised seed. But as we emerge from the waters of the great flood, we find that they have perished. Okay, after Cain had murdered Abel, God gave Adam a new offspring whose name was Seth. Because if you remember, Abel, uh, Cain had been cursed. So, the scripture now tells us that Seth was a righteous man. From here, we take a couple of notable side trips now. First, we follow Noah's son, Ham, the grandfather of Nimrod, who ruled Babylon, fighting God himself, eventually installing an idol of Baal and endorsing baby sacrifices to Molech throughout the land. <clears throat> now, we can see this in Genesis chapter 10, verses 8 through 9, and also 1 Chronicles chapter 1, verse 10. <clears throat> so many people do not know that secret societies or mystery religions, such as Freemasonry, Masonry, Illuminati, and many, many others out there, still today trace their heritage back to Nimrod. And guess what? Yes, these people... I don't know if they do baby sacrifices, but I do know that they do human sacrifices to this day. Okay, so uh, in this way, many say that Nimrod's line carries the serpent seed within these spiritual societies that lure millions away from the truth of God with secret knowledge and wisdom, just as the serpent lured away Eve. All right, and I even heard people say, well, I'm a Mason. And I just want to do good. I just wanted to use it to do good. Where does that come from? Just as a side note. All right. God abhors witchcraft and futures, uh, fortune tellers and all those things. And they use those many things also in their, in their rituals. Okay. And you cannot use something that God hates for good. Just as a side note, people. Okay. So. Let's get that straight. Now, it's crucial for all people who understand the serpent schemes so that they can follow the seed that leads to life in the Messiah, not death from the serpent. Okay. <clears throat> so second, now we will follow Noah's other son, Canaan, or Canaan, who fathered a multitude of clans, the Amorites, the Jebusites, the Hittites, and the Canaanites, who occupied the future promised land. Now, like Nimrod's lineage, they also sacrificed their children to Molech and worshipped Baal as well as a multitude of false gods. 
because now we need to go back to Noah's son, Shem, to follow Eve's seed toward the Messiah. Okay, he's the only one who we can follow because he is the only one among his sons who is righteous. So Shem became known as the first Semonite and the forefather of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, all carriers of the promised seed. And you can see this in Genesis chapter 4, uh, verses 25 through chapter 5, verse 32. Okay, I'll go slowly so you can may write this down. Chapter 10, verses 21 through 29. All of these are in Genesis. Chapter 11, verses 10 through 26. Chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. Chapter 17, verse 19. Chapter 21, verse 12. Chapter 28, verses 10 through 15. All of these are references to what I'm speaking about. Some rabbis believe that Shem is Melchizedek. I don't know about that, but that's what they believe. And he was the high priest of El Elyon, the most high God. And this we can find in Genesis chapter 14, verses 17 through 24. And Psalm 110, verse 4. So, if it's true, then we see that Eve's seed carried through from the first high priest, Adam, who passed this blessing to Seth, Noah, Shem, Abraham, and ultimately Yeshua, who was designated by God to be the high priest in order of Melchizedek. This we can find in Hebrews chapter 5, verse 10. <clears throat> so, as we near the end of Genesis, we cross one of the most stunning prophecies of the coming seed. He will be related to Judah in a profoundly spiritual way. In Genesis 49, verse 10, it says, The scepter will never depart from Judah, nor a ruler's staff from between his feet, until the one comes who owns them both, and to him will belong the allegiance of nations. So until the time of Judah and King David, both the Hebrew Scriptures and the New Testament follow the same record of the seed. Now, once we reach, once we reach David, the critical person in this messianic test of First Chronicles chapter 17, verse 11, two divergent lineages lead us toward the same seed, Yeshua, Jesus. So what's going on? How can we know for sure which path, if any, will give us the correct answer we are seeking? Let's look at these two records written by the apostles Matthew and Luke and consider how these accounts may reveal a seed who is both a man and of God. Okay, so let's speak about Matthew and the genealogy of Joseph. In Matthew's record, 41 ancestors of Yeshua are identified in three groups. <clears throat> 14 names from Abraham to David. 14 names from Solomon to Jehoniah and the Babylonian exile, and 13 names from Sheltiel to Yeshua, or Jesus. Now, with 34 fewer names than in Luke's record, Matthew clearly leaves out several generations. I don't know why. Modern rabbis say that skipping these generations compromises the integrity of proof that Yeshua needs to claim royal lineage to David's throne. And we know, unfortunately, many rabbis have to find any little thing they can to deny Yeshua's uh, messianity. Okay, so now we find the answer to this concern in the Hebrew scriptures themselves. In the Hebrew scriptures, we sometimes find names left out of genealogies. So, for example, in 1 Chronicles chapter 1 and 2, 14 generations are listed from Abraham to David similar to Matthew. And it lists all of them. Okay, so now in another example, two lists in the scripture record, record, uh, record the priestly line of Aaron. The first list in Chronicles includes 22 ancestors between Aaron and Ezra, while Ezra's own account only includes 16. And we can find this in 1 Chronicles 6 verses 1 through 15 and Ezra chapter 7 verses 1 through 5. So we can say that shortening lineages is acceptable biblical record keeping. Moreover, in Hebrew numerical values, the, the, <clears throat> there are meaning in the letters 
in, okay, in the Hebrew um, language. So the numerical value of David in Hebrew is David, all right? Dalet, Vav, Dalet, all right? David, all right? Four, six, and four. So the name David in Hebrew has a numeric value of 14. Four plus six is 10 plus four, 14. So it represents two times seven, which stands for covenant and perfection. Wow. So through his two lists of 14 names, Matthew could be emphasizing in biblical manner that Yeshua does not only come from the line of David, but that he is also the branch <clears throat> or the Messiah through whom the covenant with the Jewish people would be fulfilled, a double perfection. Okay, so in those days and at that time will I cause the branch of righteousness to grow up into David, and he shall execute judgment and righteousness in the land. This is found in Jeremiah 33, verse 15. So now, who is Yeshua's father? Who is Jesus' father? Okay, I'm sure if we did a DNA test nowadays, <laughs> we would find that he has no earthly father, right? Because if he came from the Holy Spirit, the Ruach HaKodesh, you're not going to have any DNA coming from a man. You will have some very interesting DNA. The only DNA that would be human would be Miriam's or Mary's. So by leaving out a 14th father in this group of names, Matthew may be demonstrating that Yeshua's true father is not physical, all right, um, but that is supernatural. So uh, interestingly, no scripture states that Messiah would have an earthly father. Now, Rabbi Moses de Harshan, who was an 11th century chief of the yeshiva of Narbonne, states emphatically that the Messiah will not have a human father. At least he gets that part. All right. Many are still looking for an earthly Messiah. So the Redeemer, whom I shall raise up from among you, will have no father, as it is written. Behold, the man whose name is Zimach, or branch, he shall branch up out of his place. Now, even Isaiah 52, Isaiah 52, 3 says, For he shot up right forth as a sapling. All right, this comes from the notes on Zechariah 6, 12. So, in fact, Messiah would be known from before creation as affirmed by the rabbis in the Mishnah, in the Mishnah which are oral laws compiled from uh, 10 to 200 AD. <clears throat> and later on in the Talmud, which are the oral laws with commentary. So, now the missing name leaves room for this supernatural incarnation. Perhaps to fill this vacancy, Matthew follows Yeshua's lineage with his virgin birth. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call him his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. We find this in Matthew chapter 1, verses 22 and 23. All right. And for those of you, I just want to make another side note. Those of you out there who keep saying, well, his name isn't Yeshua. It's Yahusha or Yahushua or all these other crazy things coming from. If you go to the land of Israel, it's Yeshua. That's how it's said. Okay. Not all these other strange things that people keep coming up with. So let's get it right. A name is important, people. A name means everything, especially in the Hebrew language. All right. Now. Matthew helps us see that Joseph is only Yeshua's legal father, who is in the Davidic line. <clears throat> Yet the names that appear in that line pose a problem for many rabbis who are seeking a true messianic lineage. Okay, so now let's speak about Matthew and the woman problem. All right, now don't get me wrong. Listen and hear me out. Throughout his record, Matthew leaves out several kings and instead lists five women. Oh. Very interesting. This raises another concern for the rabbis, since women are not included in genealogies. All right, which is kind of strange because now, in order to prove your Jewishness, you have to go through your mother's side. So they flip flopped. I don't know why, but that's how it is. Now Matthew writes in Matthew one verse sixteen, and Jacob begat Joseph, the husband of Mary or Miriam, of whom was born Yeshua, who is called Messiah. Now, except for Miriam, 
Some might say that God would not allow all these other four women to be in the true Messiah's lineage, since they each had scandalous issues. Hmm, very bad, right? No. Tamar was likely a Canaanite, whom Israelites were forbidden to marry in Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 3. By playing a harlot, she wasn't a harlot, she was playing a harlot, and tricking Judah into having relations with her, she bore a son named Perez, who became an ancestor of King David. Second, Rahab, who was also was a Canaanite, she did not play a harlot, she was a harlot. But she converted to Judaism and became the mother of Boaz, who was the great-grandfather of King David. Ruth was not even an Israelite, all right? became one with the Jewish people in Ruth chapter 1 verse 16 and it was accepted into the community. And this we can find in Ruth chapter 4 verses 13 through 22. But she was a Moabite whom Israelites were forbidden to marry in Deuteronomy 23 verse 3 and Nehemiah 13 verse 1. And then we, of course we have Bathsheba, the woman who King David committed adultery with and had a son. <clears throat> it was King David's wife when she conceived their son, Solomon. However, God took their first child, which you remember, who was conceived in adultery and ended in the murder of Bathsheba's husband. All right, so some Christians explain that uh, Matthew included these women to emphasize how the Messiah is the deliverer of all mankind. And that's true, Jew and Gentile, men and women, no matter how sinful they are. All right? And we all know that. They also point out that the Messiah comes through this very imperfect lineage to show his humanity. Now, while the Messiah certainly fulfilled these purposes, it is more likely that Matthew included these women to emphasize that this is not Yeshua's Davidic line to the throne, but merely Joseph's. <clears throat> so, for a look at Yeshua's right to the throne through Mary, or Miriam, we can turn to Luke. Now let's look at the genealogy of Mary in the eyes of Luke. Luke gives us explicit clues that tell us his record is the lineage of Miriam or Mary. He does this by placing a definite article, the, in front of every name except one, Joseph, son of Hay. All right, and now Luke chapter 3, verse 23 says, And Yeshua himself began to be about 30 years of age, <clears throat> being, as was supposed, the son of, now here we're missing the word, the. So the son of Joseph, who, which was the son of the Heli. All right, Luke 3, 23. The critical clue is often missed in English translations, since it's not customary to call someone the David or the Jane. Okay, we don't put the word the before the name. But in the Greek text, it becomes very obvious. By not giving Joseph uh, this distinction, <clears throat> Luke redirects the physical descendancy into Mary. We really don't have to guess at Luke's intention here. He plainly writes that Yeshua is the son, as was supposed, of Joseph, the son of the Heli. Okay. Now, Luke must list Joseph because he's following strict adherence to Hebraic protocol by leaving women out of the record. All right, so this is likely why he names Mary's father Heli, because Heli was actually Mary's father, Miriam's father. So if Mary is the daughter of Heli, why is Joseph called son of Heli? We know that in Jewish thought, a man's son-in-law could also be called his son. If you think about it, back in the book of Genesis, how did God describe marriage? A man shall leave his mother and father and go be one with his wife. Basically, at that time, up until, I don't know, not many years ago, man would leave their mother and father and go join the wife and his her family. He became part of her family. Okay, this might be a really good explanation why they say this. So even though Joseph was likely the son-in-law of Heli, Luke could rightfully call Joseph the son of Heli, son of the Heli. So yet even when Jewish scholars accept 
that Luke's lineage is actually that of Miriam or Mary, another problem arises now. Luke's genealogy takes Yeshua's line through David's son, Nathan, and not through Solomon, as is required in rabbinic Jewish thought. Okay, so now we're going to speak about Luke and the Solomon problem. Rabbis teach that only, not only would the Messiah be the son of David, but also the son of Solomon. God said that Solomon shall build a house for my name. And he shall be my son, and I will be his father, and I will establish the throne of, the, the throne of his kingdom over Israel forever. This is found in 1 Chronicles 22.10. That sounds pretty definite here. God placed a condition on Solomon's dynasty. Oh, what was that? Keep my commandments. Hmm. Did King Solomon keep his commandments? At the end, no. It says in Psalm 89, verses 30-32, if he or if his, David's children, forsake my law and do not walk according to my rules, if they violate my statutes and do not keep my commandments, then I will punish their transgression with the rod and their iniquity with stripes. So for all of Solomon's great wisdom, he became idolatrous in the end. After marrying women who followed other gods, his heart became divided. This half-hearted approach to his relationship with God manifested so that soon after his reign, the nation of Israel was split in two. But in that same psalm, God promised that he would remain faithful to his covenant to keep the seed in David's line. Okay. He didn't say through Solomon. In Psalm 989, verses 35 and 36, he says, Once for all, I have sworn by my holiness, I will not lie to David. His offspring shall endure forever, his throne as long as the sun before me. Okay, so it's not a requirement, therefore, that Messiah would come through Solomon, only a promise that would have that it could have happened that way if Solomon had met the conditions, which he didn't. So the covenant God made to David still stands, but the line and dynasty of Solomon ended with Jeconiah and Zedekiah. In fact, we even read in scripture how God cursed Jeconiah so that the Messianic lineage would not travel through him. So in Jeremiah chapter 22, verse 30, it says, none of his offspring will prosper. None will sit on the throne of David or rule anymore in Judah. Wow, that's pretty serious and very clear. This is why the record of Luke sidesteps Solomon and goes to Nathan who is still eligible to ascend to the throne. So does Yeshua pass the test? When we look at the genealogies of Matthew and Luke in a Hebraic context, we find consistencies with biblical record keeping and we find breaks with it as well. For those who believe in a divine Messiah, one could expect such a record that tries to explain how an eternal Messiah can be in the line of an earthly king. So as we consider the identity of this seed through scripture and the Hebraic understandings, it's crucial that we get the result of this first test right. So to mistakenly follow, mistakenly follow the seed of the serpent instead of the seed of Eve into mystic religions, like I said, Masons, Freemasons, Illuminati, you name it, there are hundreds out there. So for example, with the promise of secret knowledge, Revealed will keep us enslaved for eternity in sin, condemnation, and death, and eventually eternity in Hades, in hell. Okay, so as I try to explain to one person, since God hates uh, these types of things, and he hates witchcraft and sorcery and uh, divination, etc., and they're all called an abomination, which all of these secret societies use, not on top of also... Uh, human sacrifices, which they still do, okay, God hates those things. So don't tell me you can use these things for good when they are evil. You cannot have one foot on the side of the enemy, on the side of the serpent, and one side with Jesus. You cannot use good, or you cannot use evil for good. You cannot be a good witch. You cannot be a good fortune teller or diviner, whatever you want to call it. You can't do it, people. God hates it. And he says, those people will not inherit my kingdom. Okay, that's just a little side note for those of you who are still confused out there.
All right. I say this because I love you and I want you to be set free. Now, in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, it says, Now the Spirit expressly says that in the latter times some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teaching of demons, to the insincerity of liars who, whose consciences are seared. You can't get any more clear than that. Now, however, as we continue to look into the Messianic prophecies, the Lord has promised us that when we sincerely seek the truth of who his, this seed of Eve is, we will find him. So those of you who are still seeking, who don't know yet, keep seeking. Just call out. I've told people, hey, if you don't believe yet in Yeshua or Jesus as a Savior, call out to him and say, Jesus, show me. Show me who you are. Show me you're real. He will. He will. He will. He wants to. Okay. So it's so easy. It says, very simply, those who believe in me or those who believe that Jesus is the Son of God, or those who call out my name, depends on what verse you're reading and where, are saved. Okay, so in Jeremiah 33, 3, it says, Call to me and I will answer you and tell you great and unsearchable things that you do not know. Okay, that's very simple. And it doesn't need to get into the mysticism and the weirdness of all these other secret societies. Okay, now the Messianic promise that began in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, ends with Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Messiah, as God said about David, from this man's descendants, God has brought to Israel the Savior, Yeshua, Jesus, as he promised. This is found in Acts chapter 13, verse 23. And with that, I just want to say thank you for joining us today. And I hope you enjoyed this study as much as I did. I really, really enjoyed doing it. And if you'd like to help us to proclaim Yeshua to Israel and the nations, please go to our website, check us out. Uh, just look up Village of Hope and Justice Ministry or go on to our YouTube um, channel or right here on Facebook. Okay, so I thank you for joining us today. And I hope that, like I said, that you've had fun. And we are going to end with prayer. Um, so... We welcome Erbetin Gabriela again to to pray over us in the name of Yeshua. Amen. Father, we want to thank you for being in this house and in every house all over the world, in all nations, in Israel and the diaspora. Father, we thank you for your uh, provision, for your uh, mighty protection for your mighty hand upon us wherever we are in this time of trial we ask you to be protected always in all of our communication in all of our um, talk in all of our walk in all of our relationships wherever we are uh, father guide us through the darkness through your torah through your word that we might be not stumble and fall, but just follow your path, your ancient path, your Torah, that will give us always clarity, always the sermon, always your Ruach HaKodesh in us and through us to others to see who you are, who you are, Yeshua, in us, so that they might see your light to the nations. They might see your light, Yeshua. Mashiach, our Messiah, the Messiah of Israel. And Father, we also ask you for deliverance from any spirit of witchcraft, from any spirit of black magic, magic, and any type of uh, idolatry in us, in other, in all of, um, of the people of Israel, in all of the people of Israel, in Israel and in, in the diaspora, and also people in the nations, the Gentiles. Father, we ask you to deliver from any work of the devil that has been put upon people's lives during this time. We ask you for deliverance, freedom, liberty in your spirit, in your Ruach HaKodesh, Father, that all people might say Yeshua, the Messiah, he is the Lord, he is the Lord of our life, he is the Lord, and he is the Messiah of Israel. And they might recognize who you are, Yeshua, the Messiah. Amen. In your name, Yeshua. Before we leave, I would just like to impart upon you the ironic blessing 
Yevarecha Adunai Bishmanecha. Yair Adunai Panabalecha Bihunek. Isa Adunai Panabalecha Bi Sim Lecha Shalom. Bishim Yeshua Hamashiach. Sarha Shalom Shalom. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of Yeshua the Messiah, the Prince of Peace. Shalom. Thank you again for joining us today and tonight. Um, back in the States or other countries, it's still day. So thank you again for joining us. Again, I hope you really enjoyed the, this um, Bible study that we had tonight. Shalom. Shalom.